OK, we're going to look at theme 1B. Having looked at the Nativity, we're now going to look at the resurrection um, account of Jesus. There are four clear Bible passages that you're expected to know for that. What you might want to do is have a Bible to hand, because what I've done as I've gone through this is I've um, taken each of the different passages one by one and I've made uh, some comments that relate to each of the key verses in those passages. So let's start with a general explanation of what we mean by resurrection. It comes from the Latin word resurrectio, meaning to rise again. And Christians believe that after he was crucified, Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his followers for 40 days. So the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke document that Jesus told his disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He was going to suffer many things under the elders and chief priests and scribes that he was going to be killed and on the third day he would be raised. But it would be true to say, if you're looking at the Synoptic Gospels, they paid little attention to this. And so when Jesus was arrested, they fled in confusion. Shortly after his crucifixion, the apostles began to preach that God had raised Jesus from the dead, thereby proving he was the Messiah. They told others that if they accepted his Messiahship, then they could share in his resurrection meaning they too could experience life after death. And this was a big comfort as they began to spread the message of Christianity. So, as I said previously, the syllabus requires you have knowledge of four biblical texts that relate to the subject. Um, and you need to really think about how the New Testament writers viewed the concept of death, the soul, the resurrected body and the afterlife. So your first passage is Matthew 10, 28, which says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who could destroy both soul and body in heaven. So the first thing we can pick up from this passage is that clearly there is some sort of belief in the soul. And quite clearly, the one who is referred to here is God. Um, who can uh, destroy both the soul and the body in hell. So this passage is telling us that there's some concept of soul and that there's a concept of heaven and hell. This passage occurs in the middle of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is sending the apostles out to preach in his name. And I suppose what this passage is doing is describing what the Old Testament would call fear of the Lord. It's not um, abject terror or panic, it's um, a healthy kind of fear, the sort of fear that a soldier would have for his weapon or a cook has for fire on a stove. It involves respect um, at the same time, acknowledging that God has the power to utterly destroy those who are against him. So it's a right and proper fear. So here, I think in this passage, Jesus is insisting that death shouldn't be avoided at all costs because the death of the body is not the ultimate loss. The death of body and soul together in hell is the ultimate loss. So the message his apostles preach of salvation through faith in Jesus brings the promise of eternal life in body and soul to many people as well as to themselves. Now, the next major passage you have to be familiar with is John chapters 20 to 21, two very big uh, passages so uh, I won't be reading through them all in detail but I will pick out the various different bits that um, are pertinent to you. So if we start with this John 20 um, it would be true to say that John uh, has dramatic structure in his writing. He uses a rhetorical vice called chiasmus or chiasm uh, and that is where two or more clauses are balanced against each other by the reversal of their structures in order to produce an artistic effect. So um, it's a style of writing that repeats similar ideas in reverse sequence. So to give you a really simple example of chiasmus or chiasm, you could have this, never let a fool kiss you or a kiss fool you. And you can see there the reversal of the idea across the sentence. Now it'd be true to say, that the writer of John's Gospel uses chiasmus frequently and it's very much in evidence in chapter 20. So um, the textbook uh, 
gives a rather simplified um, example of chiasm or chiasmus. Um, I've gone a little more complex here just to give you an idea of how it's how it's structured. So if we take the structure of John chapter 20, we can see that in verse 14, Mary sees Jesus. So the seeing of Jesus becomes, uh, for want of a better word, theme A in your chiasmus. Then we see that Jesus tells Mary not to touch him. So this idea of so you get seeing A, touching B. He then appears to the disciples when the doors are shut. So seeing A, touching B, appearing when doors are shut, C. And then D, Jesus in verse 20, shows the disciples his wounds. So wounds become D. Then we see that the disciples are overjoyed when they see Jesus, which is E. And then he blesses them, breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit, which is F. So we've got A, B, C, D, E, F, and then with Chiasmus, it's going to reverse. So what we then see is Thomas, um, the idea of seeing Jesus. The disciples tell Thomas they've seen Jesus, so now we're reversing back to E. Thomas says he won't believe until he's seen the wounds, so the wounds are there, D. Then Jesus appears to the disciples when the doors are shut again, so that's C. Then Thomas touches Jesus' wounds, which is B. And then Jesus states, you have seen me, you have believed. Back to theme A. So there's your example of chiasmus. So one of the things you might want to consider when we look at John 20 is if John is using a rhetorical device to get, a, a get his point across, and he is making things fit into this idea of chiasmus, should these events be taken chronologically? And some scholars might say, well, no, because actually he's deliberately messing up the sequence so he can use this rhetorical device of chiasmus. You make your own decisions on that. But what we need to note about John 20, well, we certainly get this reference throughout John of, the, of this disciple who Jesus loved. You can see it in verse 2. He's also the disciple who saw and believed in verse 8. That's commonly identified as the Gospel writer John, but there is <coughs> no conclusive evidence for this. It'd be also important to note that when Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene in John 20, she doesn't recognise him and actually mistakes him for a gardener in verse 15. This would seem to suggest that the resurrected body may be different. And this is also reinforced by verses 17 and 19, where he appears in the middle of a room. OK. Um, another important thing to note is that Jesus sends Mary with a message to the disciples. An apostle is someone that preaches good news. So in a, in a sense, Mary has become an apostle to the apostles. So, um, again, this is highlighting the importance of women here in John's Gospel. OK, so we've got this aspect in verse tw in John 20 where Mary doesn't recognise Jesus at first, where he says something about don't touch me because I haven't yet ascended to the Father. We've got Jesus appearing behind uh, locked doors. And yet at the same time, we have um, when we get to the story of Thomas, that Jesus's body is undoubtedly physical. Thomas physically puts his finger in Jesus's wounds. So there is um, some confusion over what um, form the resurrected body of Jesus took in John 20. It'll be also worth noting that the giving of the spirit referred to in verse 22 seems to be very different from the Holy Spirit that the disciples received at Pentecost. And it might actually be more about marking the start of the church's mission of spreading the word to those who have not seen but yet still believe. So those are things you might want to draw out of John 20. When we get to John 21, uh, it would be true to say that this chapter is split up into three different segments. Uh, the first segment is when Jesus appears to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. That's verses 1 to 14. 
Um, a nice um, example of Jesus uh, cooking his disciples a barbecue breakfast on the beach. So what can we note out of those sections in, in verses 1 to 14 of John 21? Well, once again, if we look at verse 4, it appears that the disciples don't appear to recognise Jesus. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved recognises him when the miracle of the fish occurs. Again, you'll need to read this chapter in more detail so you can understand what I'm talking about here. Then all the disciples recognise him by verse 12. And quite clearly, when we get to John 21, Jesus's body is clearly physical. He, he's cooking, he's eating, he's you know, barbecuing some fish on the beach. Now, when we get to the second part of John 21, we've really got Jesus reinstating and commissioning Peter, Simon Peter. So um, Jesus asks Peter three times whether he loves him in verses 15, 16 and 17. And that is reflecting the three times that Jesus denied that he was a disciple of Jesus. Uh, Peter denied when he was a disciple of Jesus following Jesus' arrest. And if you want to look at that story, that's in John chapter 18, verses 15 to 26. So Jesus, uh, Peter, having denied Jesus three times, is asked by Jesus, do you love me? Peter replies three times, yes. So he is reinstated. Um, and certainly it would appear that verses 18 to 19 appear to be foretelling Peter's death. Now, Peter was traditionally crucified upside down in Rome during the persecution of Christians by Nero round about 67 CE. Um, probably the best way of going crucified upside down because he died quicker. So he wasn't that stupid old Peter. Um, but important to note that John's gospel wasn't written till the late first century CE. So therefore, that story, you know, that, that, that story of how Jesus died may have already been known and may have been inserted by the author of John's Gospel in there. Who knows? When we move on to the third part of John 21, we get John's testimony being confirmed. So basically, the verse 24 identifies the author as the beloved disciple. But this doesn't mean that he actually wrote the account. It may have been one of John's disciples, etc. But certainly his gospel claims to be an eyewitness account and the writer or writers claim the testimony is true. <coughs> and finally, the gospel ends with one last testimony to the greatness of Jesus in verse 25. It says, you know, if, if all the things were to be written down about Jesus, I suppose there would be no, not enough books to write it. So that's John 20 and 21. You've got a uh, non-corporeal resurrection and corporeal resurrection at the same time. You've got people physically putting fingers in wounds. We've got um, disciples not recognising Jesus. So all these things throw into confusion exactly what that resurrected body was like. Then we move on to Paul's understanding of the resurrection. And this is in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and it's quite a complex passage um, and it also be um, fair to note that we need to put this into context certainly Paul's letter to the Corinthians he's writing to a church that clearly has some issues if you read the whole of 1 Corinthians um, there, there, there's clearly some false practices going on and 1 Corinthians is very much quite a rant by Paul against the church in Corinth, which was a city in Greece, about how they're getting it wrong. There's um, false beliefs creeping in. And it may be that there were some false beliefs creeping in about the resurrection as well. And Paul is having a go at the church in Corinth about these false beliefs. Certainly by the time we get to 2 Corinthians, the church is very much better. So um, the church in Corinth was in crisis. When Paul was writing, his letter is endeavouring to counteract false teachings. It's possible that they may not have believed in the resurrection or imagined life ended in death or perhaps that the spirit continued in the afterlife without a body of any kind. And Paul might be writing to counteract these claims. But certainly when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, we get through to verses 3 to 7. Paul clearly states the resurrection is an objective fact. Forget all this false teaching about it didn't happen. 
it definitely happened. Paul goes on to say, you know, he was an apostle. He saw the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he states that in verse 8. And if you want to read the story of Paul's conversion, you just have to look at Acts chapter 9, 1 to 20. You know, Paul is very clear the resurrected Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. So Paul starts 1 Corinthians 15 by categorically stating, be under no illusion, the resurrection occurred. He then moves on, okay, having established that the Corinthians should believe in the resurrection of Jesus. He then goes on to challenge their own belief. He's making some logical points here, okay? Um, so what he's saying is if the Corinthians are stating that no one's resurrected from the dead, then that means that Christ couldn't have been resurrected from the dead. And he's making that point in verses 12 to 13. He then goes on to say, well, if that is the case, then logically all the preaching of the gospel is therefore false and worthless, as is the faith of anyone foolish enough to believe it. That's what he's putting through in verse 14. And then he goes on to say, well, if that's the case, if resurrection is false, anyone who believes in Jesus for the forgiveness of, for the forgiveness of sins, that's false. So they remain unforgiven. They're going to hell. And that means anyone who's already suffered and died in vain as a Christian, the whole, the whole, um, their whole belief is meaningless because their sins haven't been forgiven, because there was no resurrection, and therefore they're in somewhere where it's very hot, hell. So Paul declares again that Christ has been raised from the dead. And in verses 20 to 28, he's saying he was the, Christ is the very first person to be raised from the dead. Just as death came into the world through the sin of one man, Adam, resurrection comes into the world through the act of one man, Jesus. So he's the first to be resurrected, but because Jesus died for everyone's sins, everyone else can be resurrected. So it's that quote, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ have all been made alive. So Christ will defeat every power on earth. God will cause everything to be under his authority. And that's what Paul is really saying in verses 20 to 28. The original sin came in Adam, sentenced all of humankind to death, However, the resurrection of Jesus, just as one man, Adam, sentenced the whole of humankind to death, the death of one man, Jesus, means that everybody else can be resurrected. The original resurrection of Jesus means that we can all share in that resurrection ourselves. When we move on to 29 to 34, uh, Paul then talks about... Um, the fact that he wouldn't live a dangerous and costly life, a life as an apostle of Jesus, if there wasn't a resurrection. He talks about um, how he um, faced wild beasts in Ephesus. And what he's saying is, well, why would I put myself through all this hardship if I didn't think that there was a resurrection? So he's just making that point. And then what he goes on to do is describe what the resurrected body will be like. And this, this is absolutely key. So you need to know this bit. And this he does in verses 35 to 41. So it may be that some people have assumed that resurrection meant a reanimated corpse, We're talking zombie apocalypse or whatever. Or they might have wondered how a rotting or corrupted body could exist in a heavenly realm. Well, instead, what Paul does, he describes our current body like a seed, a seed that will die to make way for a far better body built to exist in eternity. And what he says is that that body will be as different from our current bodies as a man is from a star or, a, or the moon. So he's saying, you know, don't think about or don't compare a heavenly body with an earthly body. It's two completely different things. They're as different as a man to a star and a moon. It will be totally different. He then moves on in verses 42 to 49 to talk about how our natural physical bodies are perishable, they're temporary, they're dishonourable and they're weak. But when we come to those raised, resurrected heavenly bodies, unlike the perishable, temporary, dishonourable and weak bodies, they're going to be imperishable and they're going to be eternal and they're going to be glorified and they're going to be powerful. 
We have the natural bodies that come from Adam, from the dust of the earth, that stuff of the earth that we read about in Genesis 2, 7. And they're going to be transformed into bodies like the one Christ was raised with, made of the stuff of heaven. And that's what Paul's talking about when he's um, writing verses 42 to 49. And then finally, verses 50 to 58, he talks about how that when Christ returns, both the dead in Christ and those still who live will be transformed in an instant to these new and glorified heavenly bodies that will never die. And death will end, victory over Satan will occur, and no one will ever suffer again. And that's what 1 Corinthians 50, 58 is. So very much Paul in 1 Corinthians is talking about some form of resurrected body similar to the one we read about in John 20 to 21. And then our last um, passage is again Paul writing in his letter to the Philippians chapter 1 verses 21 to 24 and he says for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body this will be fruitful labour for me yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Now, why is this verse important? Well, Paul's saying that life on this earth is meant to be lived for Christ, but death would be even better because then Paul would be in the presence of the Lord. Paul's in no hurry to die because what he's trying to say is it's important for him to carry on spreading the gospel as far as possible. But what this verse is actually um, counteracting is the belief in soul sleep. OK. Paul is talking about what happens to a believer's soul upon death. Now, some people have argued that soul sleep is possible, and that's the view that the soul enters into a state of unawareness and doesn't go to heaven until the final judgment day. Now, this verse would seem to suggest that that is not the case. Because Paul is clearly stating that he expects to be with Christ the moment his life on earth ends. So it's instantly to heaven. It's not, you know, you, you sleep and then you wait till judgment day. And that view would also appear to be re reflected by Jesus when he's crucified in Luke's gospel, when he turns to the thief next to him and says, truly today you will be, we, be with me in paradise. Which seems to suggest that the moment of death, it's straight to heaven, straight to hell, whatever. Okay. So perhaps that's why this the syllabus has, been, has included this um, verse. So having looked at the key um, verses surrounding resurrection and the debate as to you know, how, um, is there a heavenly body, is there an earthly body, what form is the resurrected body taken, we move into two opposing views of the uh, resurrection, that of Rudolf Bultmann and N.T. Wright. Now, I think it would be true to say that Bultmann is tricky. I'm going to do my level best to try and uh, explain it to you, but you'll need to keep reading through the textbook, read some other stuff on Bultmann, and the more you read, the, the more you'll get your head around it. But he's not easy, certainly. So, let's have a look at Bultmann. So, he was a 20th century New Testament scholar. He's best remember for trying to demythologize the New Testament. So he tried to find meaning in it, not by a literal interpretation, but by looking at the existential meaning it had for those who believed. So what Bullman was concerned with was making the religious vision of the Christian faith relevant to Christians today without them having to believe in the pre-scientific world of the Bible. I'm going to explain this in a little more detail in a minute. So for Bultmann, a myth is a kind of primitive science that explains events by attributing them to supernatural causes, such as, I don't know, the sun has, uh, has been eclipsed because of our wickedness. But what Bultmann says is, you know, modern people know better and dismiss this mythological understanding of the world. Bultmann didn't think that modern humans could really ever believe in the myths of the Bible, just as we don't believe literally that there is a Hogwarts. 
What he wanted to do was to get to some essential insights that have meaning separate and apart from the mythology surrounding them. So, he says, if you look at the, the world of the first century CE, the world of the Bible, you know, we've got this belief that the Son of Man would come on the clouds of heaven. There'd be a day of judgment. There would be bliss for the saved and the torments of hell for the damned. We believe that, you know, the New Testament writers believe that Jesus was begotten by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, a pre-existing being who took upon himself the cross so everyone could be redeemed. We have other New Testament beliefs, such as the world is ruled by the devil. There's a three-storied universe with heaven, earth and hell, each in a ge geographical location. We've got miracles occurring, we've got spirit possession. Now for Boltman, this was, this was not the sort of world a rational human being could believe in. It's too hard to believe. So for Boltman, Jesus' resurrection is yet another one of these first century myths. He says, we live in a modern era, era where we believe scientifically that every effect has a cause and that these causes can be ascertained. This is not possible with any of these first century New Testament beliefs, so we must dismiss them. And if we dismiss these beliefs, if we dismiss the virgin birth, the resurrection, the miracles, etc. That leaves a Christian with three options. Your first option is to retreat into the mythological world, accept it. Your second option is to find all the passages in the New Testament that aren't laden with the mythology, those mytholog mythological presuppositions, such as you know when Jesus says, uh, "Love your neighbour as yourself." That's fine. The issue with that is what you then get is the Christian message is just reduced to a, a, a load of ethical preachings by Jesus. It's nothing more than that. Well, your third choice is to find a deeper meaning in the mythological passages. Now, for Boltman, three is the key because he says we, we can't retreat to one. We can't go to this mythological world because he accepts the advances of science. And he also can't go with two because he thinks there's more to Christianity than just some ethical code to live by. And it's clear that the lives of the disciples were transformed by their encounter with Jesus. And so therefore that led him to the third option, which is find a deeper meaning in the mythological passages. <clears throat> so, for Boltman, now we get to the difficult stuff, guys. The resurrection is an event outside of time and space. It's a transcendent event. This means we don't have access to this event in our spatio-temporal world. The resurrection didn't occur in the world. It's a transcendent event. However, the important event is that the disciples encountering this had hope, energy and love in time and space. So whatever occurred, the effect on the disciples was hope, energy and love. That was the concrete effect in the world. Therefore, for Boltman, it's not the historical Jesus that's of interest, but the faith of the disciples in the transcendent Christ. <coughs> so Boltman's not interested in the Jesus of history. He is merely interested in the Christ of faith. So for Boltman, the reality conveyed by the myth, remember it's a transcendent myth, it didn't happen in time and space, is that those who encountered Jesus encountered a power stronger than death and destruction. They encountered life and they encountered hope. And that is the message for Bortman that we need to take. That's the message behind the myth. 
we've got to go on living a full life today of life and hope. The church calls people to faith in the risen Jesus, but one needs to have faith today, faith in something larger than oneself, something transcendent. So when Bultmann took away the supernatural elements of time and space, such as the empty tomb, the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, he arrives at the basic insight that there is something beyond us and our individual efforts in this life. There is a transcendence, and it's that that we must grasp. We need to live as if that transcendent world is already here. Bultmann believes we are called to live in God's future, even now in the presence of death and darkness. So although we live in the spatio-temporal world, we're not yet in that transcendent world. We should live as if we were. And that's the meaning of the resurrection for Bultmann. The resurrection of the disciples' belief, the resurrection of the disciples' lives, the resurrection of the disciples' hope, that's the resurrection of the New Testament. That's the message behind the resurrection. It's not a physical resurrection of Jesus. It's a resurrection of belief by the disciples. Bultmann, and this is a quote from Alistair McGrath, hence the picture of him, regarded the entire enterprise of the historical reconstruction of Jesus as something of a dead end. History for Bultmann was not of fundamental importance in understanding Jesus. It was merely necessary that Jesus existed and that the Christian proclamation of kerygma is somehow grounded in his person. So for Bultmann the cross and the resurrection are historical phenomena in that they took place within human history but can only be discerned by faith as divine acts. So the cross for McGrath and the resurrection are linked to the kerygma as the divine act of judgment and the divine act of salvation. It's this the divine act which is of continuing significance and not the historical phenomenon which acted as its bearer. The kerygma is thus concerned not with matters of historical fact but with conveying the necessity of a decision on the part of its hearers. So that as encountered with the divine act we change our lives. That's what Alistair McGrath believes Baldwin was going on about. So, for Baldwin, God can never be used as an explanation of this worldly events. God is radically transcendent. His acts can never be placed along other causal influences in the interpretation of what occurs. So in other words, you can't use God as a reason for a healing, a miracle. You can't use God as a reason for someone coming back from the dead because God is ultimately transcendent. He's not, a, he's not involved in the human world. So for Bultmann, this principle has no exceptions. Whether we're dealing with events recorded in the scripture or with the religious experience of mystics, that all can all be explained in terms of this worldly causes. There's no divine cause. God is too transcendent for that. Doesn't mean that God's irrelevant to our existence. It means that he's hidden to every eye except the eye of faith for Baldwin. So faith for Baldwin sees God's act alike in objective events such as the healing of a child and the unobservable happenings of personal existence. The eye of faith is precisely the way of seeing all nature and existence in its boundedness by a radical dependence upon that which altogether transcends, that is God. Let's have a look at that again, okay? So faith, you see a child being healed if you see unobservable happenings of personal existence, it explains things to you. Doesn't mean it is God, but it explains its faith. So for Bultmann, faith is all that matters. Nothing historical is important. Through the eye of faith, 
events that were otherwise fully explained in terms of this worldly causes can be seen as acts of God. So that's Bultman, and as I said, he's tricky, so you're going to need to go over and keep rereading, try and make sure you've got it straight in your minds. Um, N.T. Wright, on the other hand, is a little more straightforward. <coughs> he, he basically says Bultman's wrong, the resurrection is an historical fact. So he's a leading British New Testament scholar, uh, he's now at St Andrews University, former Bishop of Durham, and he believes that a careful historical study of the Bible yields much less myth and much more historical fact than Bultman believed there to be. In fact, he believes that the evidence is compelling for both the empty tomb and the bodily appearances of Jesus to the disciples after his resurrection, and that these two events are the best explanation for the church's faith in the resurrection. So N.T. Wright says Bob was got it completely wrong. The resurrection was an historical fact. Now, Wright is very concerned about um, theologians giving bad arguments that scholars use to deny the reality of the empty tomb and the resurrection appearance. There are lots of them because uh, he says these bad arguments don't deal with the ancient context, care, context carefully. So some people have put forward the idea of swoon theory. This was very popular in the, uh, against a popular argument against the resurrection of the 19th century. And the swoon theory was that uh, proposed that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. It merely appeared that he did. He wasn't dead, but just fainted. After all, before the use of modern medical treatments, it wasn't uncommon for people to be thought of as dead, but to be revived before their burial. So people did get it wrong. Wright says, well, that's a load of trash. It's a bad argument. Romans knew how to kill people. You know, they wouldn't make a mistake with a crucifixion. The reappearance of a battered and exhausted Jesus would hardly have suggested that he'd gone through death and out the other side, that the kingdom of God had come, the resurrection had occurred, he was the Messiah, etc. People, the disciples wouldn't have thought that if he just swooned. So Wright dismisses that. Swoon theory, it's a, it's a bad argument. It doesn't make sense. Romans were very adept at killing people. Another bad argument that uh, Wright uh, puts forward is to suggest that the pre-scientific era people were more willing to believe in resurrection since they weren't as aware of the laws of nature as we are today. And Wright says, come on, you know, if you look at careful analysis, it's simply not true. You know, you've got Plato, you've got Homer, Aeschylus, Pliny. The ancients per knew perfectly well that dead people didn't rise. You don't need modern science to tell you that. That's just sloppy thinking and bad argument. So let's go back to his disagreement with Bultmann. Remember, Bultmann didn't believe we had access to historical events surrounding the resurrection. Yet for Wright, there are multiple testimonies of the Gospels which stem from eyewitness reports. And what makes these reports so important for Wright is that Jesus' followers were clearly not expecting a resurrection. And that is key for Wright. Furthermore, <coughs> Bultmann reduces the claims about the resurrection to just a private religious experience. When in fact, the disciples also made claims about the public nature of the event and its meaning for the world. So at the heart of Wright's argument is the idea that in order to believe in the resurrection, the disciples had to radically change or mutate their ideas about life after death. And these changes are so great, they could only have occurred if the resurrection actually happened. It's difficult to believe they would do this since there are so are many other ways of viewing life after death, as I said, unless something had actually happened. So, Wright says, the resurrection cannot have been a myth invented by the early Christian community. And it can't have been a myth because the idea of a Messiah dying and being bodily resurrected to eternal life was completely unexpected in Jewish theology and therefore they wouldn't have invented it as it would have persuaded nobody 
In Judaism, when people die, they stay dead. At the most, they might reappear as apparitions or be resuscitated in life for a while, but then die again later. Just as it isn't scientific to us now to claim resurrection, so it wasn't believable to them back then either. Also, for Wright, there was no concept of bodily resurrection to eternal life of a single person, especially of the Messiah. The Jews only believed in the general resurrection of all the righteous dead on Judgment Day. The Messiah was only a this-worldly political figure, so the belief on the resurrected Messiah was completely against all that the Jewish um, beliefs held. So, Wright's case for the resurrection has two parts. Part A is the way that Christian belief about resurrection emerged. The fact that it was so different from Jewish belief. And remember, the early Christians were Jews. And the fact that it's so remarkably different, this belief about resurrection, demands an explanation for Wright. It, and he says it could only be because the resurrection really happened to Jesus that these beliefs changed. The second part of his case for the resurrection is the fact that Wright asserts that Jesus did bodily resurrect and this solves a number of historical puzzles which otherwise can't be explained. So let's look at these two, case, uh, two parts in more detail. Now, the early Christians held firmly, like most of their Jewish counterparts, to a two-step belief about the future. First, death and whatever lies immediately beyond. And secondly, a new bodily existence in a newly remade world. OK, so for the early Christians, res resurrection is not a fancy word for life after death. It denotes life after life after death. And over the 200 years from the death of Jesus, this Jewish belief about you die and then you have a new bodily existence underwent a load of changes. Wright calls these mutations among Christians. Why, given that most people are conservative in keeping their beliefs, the changes are so striking that Wright says the historian's got to ask what set them in motion. And Wright, again, is saying that the changes are an, are an inexplicable part of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So the way that this Jewish belief about resurrection changed in early Christianity, these mutations in belief, seven mutations, clearly show the resurrection must have actually happened because the change in belief is so radically different from what it was, clearly something must have happened. So let's have a look at these seven mutations. So the first mutation, is there's no diversity of belief among Christians about resurrection. So in Judaism, there's a range of views about what happens with resurrection, whether it's physical, whether it's a spiritual resurrection. Some Jews didn't believe in it at all. Judaism had a wide variety of beliefs in resurrection, but in Christianity, there's only one single view of that resurrection. That is a massive embarking from the key Jewish belief. So that's your first mutation, the fact that there's a really non-diverse belief amongst Christians. Your second mutation is that in Judaism, the belief in resurrection just wasn't very important. You were still a Jew whether you believed in it or not. Well, that's not the case in Christianity. It's absolutely central to the Christian belief. So again, a big mutation away from the Jewish belief. Thirdly, in Judaism, it's really vague as to what sort of body the resurrected body would be. But for Christians, it's, as in Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it's incorrupt, it's transformed, it's got new properties, it's a new creation by God. So it's really clear what it's going to be like. So again, a third mutation away from that Jewish belief. Fourthly, it's very clear that in Judaism, the resurrection takes place on Judgment Day in a general resurrection as a large scale event happening to all God's people or the whole race. But never would Jews believe that resurrection happened to one person in the middle of history 
anticipating and guaranteeing a final resurrection for all. It just wouldn't have happened, so Wright says. Fifthly, in Christianity, if Jesus redeemed the world to bring it to God in resurrection, then Christians must continue Jesus' work on earth and transform, transform all aspects of the world towards God. So this is a new way of what collaborating with God means compared to the Jewish view of just obeying the laws. Sixthly, there is a new metaphorical concept of resurrection, which is referred to as being born again. In Judaism, that doesn't exist. It simply means to return from exile to come home in a literal way. And finally, Christians claim Jesus was Messiah precisely because of the resurrection. But in Judaism, the Messiah was not even meant to die, let alone be resurrected, because the Messiah was a political figure going to bring liberation and rule to God's chosen people. So those are your seven mutations. When we move on to part B, showing that the, for right, that the resurrection solves some historical puzzles. Hallucinations of Jesus, bringing feelings of Jesus' presence, forgiveness and love would not be enough to make anyone say that Jesus is not actually dead and buried or that he'd been literally raised from the dead. Many people have such experience of their lost loved ones, but don't claim they're not dead. So for right, the, the fact that it had such an effect on the disciples meant it can't have been a hallucination. And it's quite clear that the Gospels speak of an empty tomb and of resurrection appearances. You've only got to look at John chapter 20 and 21. Both together strongly suggest a bodily resurrection. Each on its own proves for nothing. And as I've mentioned before, the Jewish belief was that the real Messiah would not die. Jesus' followers claimed he was the true Messiah precisely because he did die and resurrect. And finally, um, in some ways, more importantly, bodily resurrection was not a Jewish belief. So however many visions they had, they would not have concluded, the early disciples, that he'd been bodily resurrected. There's a belief in God exalting people, e.g. they didn't die but went straight to heaven, as in the case of the prophet Elijah. So Jesus' disciples wanted to show that Jesus was some way special with God. They would have said he was exalted, not physically raised from the dead in bodily form. The very fact that they did would seem to suggest that for right that it actually did happen. The other thing you could also add here is the Gospels say the women were the first witnesses to the resurrection. But I don't know what I've put there. Um, but women's evidence was discounted in Roman times. They were seen as second class citizens. If the appearances were made up, what would have happened, the gospel writers would have made, first put men as the key people to see Jesus in order to convince people. And the very fact that women are put in the gospels would seem to suggest that it might have actually happened for Wright. And then this is another key point for Wright. Jesus' followers didn't abandon him when he died. Why? For right, unless they knew he was still alive and powerful, why didn't they abandon him? There were numerous accounts of false messiahs that appeared and attracted followers, but when they were killed, the followers disbanded. This didn't happen in the case of Christianity. So those disciples must have been convinced that he rose again from the dead. And it's quite clear that the resurrection had an immediate and concrete effect on the disciples' beliefs. They go out and preach that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't stop to philosophize about what this means as a future general re uh, resurrection. Their reaction is immediate and urgent. Jesus is the risen Lord. And it's quite clear that from very early on, Christians did refer to Jesus as Lord. They addressed prayers to him. They sang hymns to him as they would to God. They contrasted the real power of Jesus against the power of someone like Caesar, who could inflict the death penalty, but who could do no more. And the, it's really clear that the early church took care of the sick and scorned their own arrest, death and torture. Why? Why were all these disciples, for right, prepared to go to their death unless they were convinced that they would have life after death themselves? Very strange. So for right, these answer the questions. There has to be a resurrection.
You could also look at the style of the gospel accounts. And this is the idea that the resurrection accounts of the gospels are the bare bones, they're fact describing narratives. The resurrected Jesus is surprisingly modest. He's unlike a resurrected God. He's mistaken for a gardener. He's transformed. There are absolutely no Old Testament quotations showing that this would happen. There's no Old Testament precedent for such an event. There are four gospel versions, which are not derived from one another. They're based on very separate early oral traditions and they agree on the essential points. Therefore, for right, it must have happened. So the conclusion is the best explanation for the historical data of how the disciples behaved and what early Christians believed about resurrection for right can only be explained if God raised Jesus bodily from the dead. This community would not have suddenly begun to believe in the single resurrection of the Messiah who wasn't even supposed to die, and then recklessly lived their lives witnessing to this belief. They wouldn't have done it. They were the only ones who saw him killed and then walking around again after his death. Their belief was based for right on their own personal experiences of a resurrected Jesus, and they were witness to this.